Well, thank you all for getting up so early this morning. Um, I think we'll give this talk just enough controversy to keep you awake because preventive imaging, especially for cancer, has become a very controversial subject. Uh, we're going to clarify what it is, how it helps, why I think it's so controversial, and then I'd like to leave a few minutes for live, probably lively discussion. So we start with the world of medical imaging. It began with some medical artists who tried to define and document normal anatomy. At the time these designs were uh, made, normal anatomy was uncharted territory. We were limited to what we could actually see with the naked eye. So now this came a little bit later, uh, but the focus was still on illustrating by drawing what we saw with the naked eye when we look inside the human body. Of course, the biggest limitation was how to look inside the human body because, of course, we had to physically cut the person open to see, which could be a problem for some people. So, the first true advance came about 60 years ago with what was, at the time, brand new, state-of-the-art, amazing technology. Advances after this followed quickly, and soon we were able to see right inside the human body without the smallest incision. So here you can see the ribs, you can see the pelvis, and so on. So this was an interesting advance. This was the total body scan introduced around 1968 by the creators of Star Trek. And 20 years later, we came up with this. Um, this is the total body bone scan, and so it seems like the makers of Star Trek at least seem to have a good grasp of where medicine was headed. Again, this was from 1968. This is the same product being used for scanning an actual patient. And 40 years later, the same product appears again. So you may ask, where am I going with all of this? And what's it got to do with imaging for cancer? We're getting there. One more historical reference. CT started with this. And I'm going to point up here. So this is how CT started. Um, you can see when it started, the images were barely decipherable. It was all a bunch of coarse pixels and vague imagery of the brain and cerebral ventricles. Now, of course, you can see that we have vivid 3D color images of the skull. And on this particular image, we've isolated the blood vessels and can nicely see an aneurysm right in the center there. So the point is that people's tendency, their natural tendency, is to find uses for the continuously evolving technology. Everybody that was an early user of an iPad or early user of a PC understands that there are people who, as soon as it comes out, we want to find different things that we can use it for. Give us the technology and we'll find a use. So that leads to the following total body scan. And clearly somebody found a use for this technology. Over time, the science of radiology has evolved from simple images to full color 3D imaging. It actually evolved because of the makers of Star Wars. Uh, some cardiologists met with George Lucas after seeing the movie and said, can you do that stuff for us? And George Lucas then wrote the first software program for 3D medical imaging. Anyway, it's evolved since that time from CT to MRI to MRI spectroscopy, nuclear medicine, and optical fluorescence. We've gone from being able to look at the anatomy in a coarse x-ray to looking at the anatomy in a detailed CT scan to beginning to look at molecular physiology and function using nuclear medicine and optical fluorescence. So these fantastic advances have led the public as well as the medical community to the conclusion that anything can be done. To paraphrase the kinds of comments pe people make, if we can find craters on Mars and on the moon, we should be able to find any little tumor in our, in our own bodies. The problem is that the public sees this fascinating and, development and developing state-of-the-art technology and assumes that we should be able to see just about anything all the time. And the medical community is a part of that public. It's a part of that public perception because the doctors, not the ones actually doing the radiology itself, but other physicians tend to have the same broad perspective. If we can see this, we should be able to see everything else. So we get titles like this. There we go. Um, no more excuses. 
no more lung cancer, as though CT can now eradicate lung cancer. Okay, so it's true that CT is the most sensitive imaging test for identifying pulmonary nodules. There was a recent study about a year and a half ago of 35,000 people, 35,000 people showed that screening the at-risk population, people with cancer, I mean uh, people with uh, smokers and so on, screening them with CT imaging would increase the life expectancy of those patients that have cancer by an average of 10 years. That's an average of 10 years. So that means that for every person whose cancer was advanced anyway, whose life expectancy was only going to be one or two years by the time we screened them, there's somebody else who was found whose life expectancy would be extended by 20 years or so, added to their life expectancy. So this year, lung cancer will kill about 160,000 people, more than breast, colon, and prostate combined. And we know that CT scanning will detect it earlier and have a significant impact on outcome. So chest x-ray, the most common test used. CT scanning gives a more detailed picture, and we can see if it's spread to lymph nodes and surrounding tissues. So CT scanning is clearly the way to go. Now, one study showed that at least 80% of the lung cancers were diagnosed at st uh, that were diagnosed at stage one when we use CT scan as a screening exam, and therefore the curability of these tumors is much, much higher than the success rate would be if we only had chest x-ray or waited for signs and symptoms to develop. So there's your argument for doing CT screening on everybody that's at risk. So with CT imaging, we got newer and more applications of computer technology. Now we have computer-aided detection. Um, this shouldn't be misconstrued as computer-aided diagnosis. We still need the radiology to make the diagnosis. The computer's not there for that. But it's to help detect the pulmonary nodules. It's to help us win the Where's Waldo game of finding that nodule um, that's uh, hidden behind a rock. So computer-aided detection allows identification of the nodules. It allows us to quantify how many nodules there are. And by doing follow-up studies, we get an automatic comparison with previous exams so that the computer measures the nodule at one point in time and compares it to the exact same nodule, which it sometimes may be a little confusing when there are multiple nodules from the previous study.